Thank you, I think. <laughs> How would I know? <laughs> I'm lucky to be able to speak English, and some people say I don't speak it, speak it well, so. Um, nevertheless, I don't understand uh, Dutch very well. There are too many O's. <laughs> Not enough vowels. <laughs> you know, have all these consonants stacked up against each other. How do you speak it? I don't know. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get this thing on my uh, belt. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Does he do that often? <laughs> Well, um, I think we're going to have a good time because you laugh easily, and I, uh, a positive reinforcement needs to make people laugh, so you want to reinforce something I say either. You just smile or laugh, and I'll be happy. Um, I, I, uh, I tell people that I'm probably one of the best examples of positive reinforcement that you can find because I've been positive reinforced for talking for 50 years, and I can talk well beyond your ability to listen. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, if uh, you finish listening before I finish talking, just uh, get up and leave. And leave your uh, how many of you have a problem? Can I see your hand? Have some kind of problem in your life? <laughs> how many of you who have a problem would have fewer problems if somebody else did what they were supposed to do? Now, if you get people to act right, you have fewer problems. And certainly we find that work, that's the case, right? We pay people, uh, we give them benefits, and they still don't act right. I mean, we find that things are not done on time, or things are done with errors, or, or uh, they're too busy talking to each other to do their work. So there are all kinds of issues that we have. Now, if you listen carefully, I'm going to tell you how to solve those problems. And I promise I'll do that. There's a catch, however. People don't do what they're told. You ever notice that? And of course, when people don't do what they're told, what do we do? What's the next response? If I tell you to put that book down and come to dinner, and you don't do it, what I do? You tell them again, right? Now, the more times you tell them, the meaner you get. You ever notice that? <laughs> the first time you say, hey, it's dinner time. I don't want to have to tell you again, it's dinner time. This is the last time I'm telling you. Get yourself in here. I mean, uh, in, in the book, uh, Bring Out the Best of the People, the third chapter is called Louder, Longer, and Meaner. And that's the progression that most people go. You know, you try to be nice, but when nice doesn't work, you ultimately get mean. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you again, or if I have to come in there, you'll be sorry. You know, something along those lines, right? Now, the thing that is taken business in America sometimes to understand is that as much as they tell people what to do and they try to improve communication, they try to let people know precisely what it is they want to do, they don't do it. And we've been stop trying to solve this problem for a thousand years. Oh, we're talking uh, about uh, my mother being 102, but you should see her mother. <laughs> <laughs> Still alive? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> um, now, I, what I want to talk about for the next hour or so, and I'm going to try to stop, and Eric, you're going to. What I discovered yesterday is that half the population is named Eric. We had, we had six people in a meeting, three of them named Eric. And the way you told the difference is some of them had a C and some of them had a K. Eric with a K, Eric with a C. But anyway, uh, somebody needs to tell me when I have five minutes left in the hour, right? Um, because I want to talk to you about the science of human behavior. Now, I, uh, like Morris, I grew up as a clinical psychologist and worked in a state hospital with 
and had a private practice of people who had uh, problems. And um, the uh, gist of that was that I was trained clinically, traditionally, and I discovered uh, even when I was being trained, the what I was doing wasn't working. You know, you think of the typical psychologist as, you know, rubbing his beard and saying, mmm, how does that make you feel? Mmm, mmm, mmm. You know, I realized that, that a, a therapist in most situations is a paid listener. You learn to listen to people because you didn't want to say too much because you want them to discover their problem. That was a theory anyway. It never worked. It didn't work. And when I was uh, in my internship, I was assigned uh, children as patients initially. And I'm trying to do that with the child. Come on. There's got to be a better way. And I would try to interpret the child's behavior. You know, the child would have a doll and pull the head off of the female doll. And I will say, you hate your mother. <laughs> How'd you know that? <laughs> but but uh, the, the point is that psychology, although if you had a test and they asked you to define psychology, if you said the science of human behavior, you'd get it right. You'd get it. But it is not. Psychology, there are more theories of behavior than there are psychologists. Because every psychologist has at least two. Now, if you think of the science of behavior, how can there be many sciences of behavior? It's the, a science, right? And a science should, should be comprehensive in terms of it explains behavior. Now, I was telling somebody earlier, I, uh, I started in a state hospital. And the reason it started in a state hospital was because we had uh, wards, we would call them, that uh, they were so overcrowded that the back wards, in other words, they said these people are basically hopeless. And so uh, they were lucky to even get medication because they were short staffed. So when we came along and said, look, Let's try something new. Come on in, come on in, oh God, come on in. Because they were, they were able to tell the politicians, we're, we're, we're doing these studies with these people. Well, the problem was, it exceeded beyond everybody's expectations, including their own. And people who had not uh, fed themselves, uh, gone to the bathroom by themselves, uh, for 20 years, all of a sudden, we're coming to dinner when called, or uh, you know, going to the bathroom by themselves, or feeding themselves, and so on. And as I say, in, in biblical days, this would have been called a miracle. You know what I'm saying? What's happened to him? All of a sudden, he's talking. Yet I had nobody heard him talk for 20 years, and now he's talking. How did that happen? Well, it was because of uh, a particular approach we were taking with them, which involved, um, as most people would come to understand, positive reinforcement. Now, I can tell you that uh, positive reinforcement is the most effective technique you can use to change the behavior of anybody anywhere. But by the same token, it is the most misunderstood and misused. Now, I've been doing it in business for 40 years. I know I don't look that old. I mean, you don't need to tell me. I, I, I know I don't look that old. <laughs> you know, I'm 80. I'm 80 years old. I'm even older than Marius. But you look younger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, you, you practice positive reinforcement very well. <laughs> um, how many of you think, you, in, do, do you play golf in Holland? Has anybody plays golf in Holland? No? I thought so. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it, 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 do you think you could learn to play golf by reading a book? No. 
There's no way, because if, you, if you've got that book, I want to read it. You know? <laughs> but it's interesting how many people think they can attend a lecture like this and learn something. Most of you will not be able to tell your spouse tonight, your spouse at home, what you've heard today. Because I noticed most of you are not taking notes. So you couldn't even refer to you know, what, what you told me. Well, let me see. Here, the other said, those of you who take notes will not learn the most. There's a saying, I love old sayings, and sometimes when I can't find an old saying, it's my purpose, I make it up. Because people love old sayings. You know, you know it, it has more weight than something. I, I say, oh, I just thought of something. That doesn't impress you. So now, here's an old saying. Oh, man, what was it? Now, listen to this carefully. Talking is learning. Listening is teaching. That's true. Talking is learning. Listening is teaching. You, you thought it's the other way around, right? You thought I was going to teach you something. In reality, what I'm telling you is I'm teaching you. I'm, you're teaching me something. You've already done it because you laughed at my joke. My attempts to, at humor, you know, you laughed, you responded. Does that affect my behavior? Of course it does. I know it does. You fell into the trap of reinforcing me, you see, and, and it's like if I run over, it's not my fault. Because you reinforced me for talking and talking beyond the limits of what I was supposed to do. The reason I'm running the most is because I'm behaving the most, right? I'm moving about, I'm talking, I'm doing other things. And you're just sitting there, listen, your, your, your behavior is minimal. So you can't, very, you can't learn very much. Now, if you understand the full implication of that, then it has a lot of things to say about how you run a business, how you, uh, how you operate in terms of getting people to do the thing quote, that, that they're paid for and so on. Because most of the time, we try to tell them what to do, right? Well, they're not learning something. There's another old saying, I didn't make this up, but it says, tell me now, teach me later. Because you learn when you receive consequences to your behavior. And so you're giving me consequences. You smile, you frown, or you look bored, or you do these things, and all those things impact what I do. Now, here's the important thing. I know that. But does it still affect my behavior? Of course it does. Because I'm a person, just like you're a person, and just because I know the laws of gravity doesn't mean that it exempts me from them, right? Now, there's not, a, there's not a part of any business represented here where people are integral to what's done. Uh, I have um, this uh, picture that somebody took of a, a factory, a modern factory. And if, as you look at that, if you can see it clearly, uh, what do you notice is missing? For no people. I went, I went to a factory in Japan over 20 years ago that was completely, completely automated. At night, they turned the lights out and went home. And they made product all night long. That was 20 some years ago. And we made a lot of advances, and I wish I had the time to give you a, 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 a talk on technology because of some of the things that are being done today are just truly amazing. I mean, literally amazing. I learned just last week that, in fact, they now are able, if you go in, let's say you go into the uh, hospital with a wound on your, on your hand or the arm or something, they can take DNA, a swab of your mouth, they can make skin, they can make your skin and put over it as a patch. Rather than put a Band-Aid on, they just put your skin on. And it heals much quicker uh, you, you don't reject it. And, I mean, it's just the, the, I, I could talk to you all day about some of the things that are being done. They print the skin, by the way, with a 3D printer. They print it. 
mean, I'm not talking about some, uh, I'm talking about a printer that cost you $500 to buy. 3D printers can make most of its parts. In probably two years, the printer will be able to make itself. It has babies. Baby printers. Huh? You can buy a $500 printer and go into the printing business. Selling printers. Now, what I've learned from going to Singularity University out in California, which is, you know, they want to talk about the latest in artificial intelligence and robots and, you know, all this sort of stuff, uh, is that uh, as much as they know about technology, they know nothing about motivation. Because the people that make these machines think that the machines are going to solve the problem. And my point is that somebody at least has to turn on the machine. Well, they say, well, no, we got, we got, the machine can turn itself on. In 50 years, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Predicts that it'll be, robots will be indistinguishable from people. Matter of fact, Maybe some of you now, I don't know. <laughs> but how would I know? How would I know? How would I know? But the thing about it is that as technologically advanced as we become, there's a point sometime, in the, at least sometime in the future, between now and then, that we're going to need a robot to assist us. We need that. The robot's not. It's like uh, there are movies now about robots, and there's a movie called Her, where a guy fell in love with his computer. And uh, that's already happening, by the way, with uh, robot uh, dogs. They make these robot dogs that go into dangerous places. And because they provide a benefit to the user, they, they form an emotional attachment to them. They want to keep them, and they, they, they grieve when they've blown up. <coughs> That's a natural thing. Because we like situations where we have some benefit from being with somebody or something. You have favorite things around your house that are not animate, but you like them. And, and you, 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 when they break or when you can't use them anymore, you feel sad about it, right? And you sometimes you just keep the old thing, even though it doesn't work, because you just hate to throw it away. Well, that's natural. But it's an example of positive reinforcement and how it affects us in terms of the way we, we behave, wherever we are. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time to teach you the science. I want to give you a vision of what the science can do. Um, it, 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 think about uh, psychology. I already said it doesn't have a science. It, it, psychology is the science of the mind. Now, I can tell you, I've been married 58 years, and sometimes I'm happy about that, and sometimes I'm not. You know, right now, I'm pretty good with it. But as long as I've lived with her, I cannot read her mind. I'm trained to read people's minds. I mean, I got a degree in mind reading. But I've got to tell you some of the things she does. I mean, what are you doing? She said, Well, it's perfectly obvious. To who? <laughs> no, it's what goes in her mind, what comes out. It's like, where'd you get that? can't tell what she's going to do. I mean, I've lived her a long time, and I can't read her mind. And any time, you know, it's popular these days to have books. If you want to sell books, put in the title something about neuroscience. Oh, boy. That'll, that'll get the buyers. Because people feel, and, and the, the, the authors will tell you that they're able, with electrodes on your head and so on, to read your mind. They're wrong. They can't do that. It's a fraud. They can't do that. They, nobody can read your mind. Now, you see, 
I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of uh, uh, body language. You see, because people who read body language, like if, if you do like this, what they say that means. Everybody understands that it, it, it means you're close to my idea, right? I mean, you're, you're kind of skeptical about what I'm saying, that sort of thing. Well, you know why I think people do this? I think a more reasonable explanation, number one, they're cold. Yeah. And number two, it's comfortable. It's more comfortable for people who have a big stomach, you know, you just kind of put your <laughs> arms down on your stomach. But we don't have to go into this. You see, I can tell you, anytime you try to figure somebody out, you're more likely to be wrong, wrong than right. And so what we try to do is to look at behavior and, and to attend to behavior in its own life. That somebody says, I love you, we assume they mean that. But see, it, it's like with my wife, and I know you've had a similar kind of experience. When I say to my wife, what's, the, what's wrong? What's the matter? She says, nothing. I know you better not say, well, I'm off to play golf, or I'll see you later. Don't do that. <laughs> now, am I not reading body language? Well, I, I, I'm not reading her language, but I know that that behavior, the way she's, what she says, and what her body position is, has, I have learned that is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. So you better be timid. You better say, well, you, it seems like there's something going on. <laughs> Tell me about it. And finally she'll say, well, do you know what you did? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we learn in terms of interaction with people, we learn to certain ways we use our hands, the way we use words and so on, means something one way or another. If you say, if you say, you're doing a good job, that means, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. Because he tells everybody to do a good job. So how would I know that I'm doing a better job than somebody else, or I'm even doing a good job? Because he may be saying that. You probably, oh, you're just saying that. Now, I want to emphasize to you today uh, that we're talking about all behavior. We started in clinical situations because, in fact, it was an easy place to go. Now, if you want to do something radical, something experimental, then it, since nobody's doing anything, we were welcome. But when we got the result there, then they always said, well, it works there, but will it work? Now, you may not be able to tell this, but I'm from the South in the United States. And I don't think I have an accent, but other people tell me that I do. <laughs> and uh, when we would start doing stuff in the South, which, which you did, uh, people when we say, well, it worked over there, on a plant over the other side of town, they'd say, yeah, but those guys, we're different, right? We're different. Same kind. We're different. They make so and so, we make so and so. We're different. Well, when we worked with that plant and it was got good results, then we'd go north and they'd say, Well, here's let me tell you what we did down south. And guess what they'd say? We're different. And when we did our first work in Italy, it was the first work we did outside the United States, they said, well, we're different. Well, guess what? They're right. <laughs> Is anybody in here that's different from you? I mean, we're all different. You see, now, the interesting thing about a science is that it has to work. If it's, a, if it's truly a science, guess what? It works with everybody. And there are no two people alike. Not even, not even a twin is like the other. Every twin knows which one was born first, right? And it's like, well, Mama always favored you because you were her first child. I, you see, the second child coming into the world is, is treated different. 
And then my uh, master's uh, thesis on, uh, I mean, on my uh, uh, doctoral thesis on uh, birth order and the sheep. And uh, what you find is that most firstborn go to, church, go to college, much fewer than later born, even though the family is in a better position economically, usually, to send the last born to school than they were the first. And firstborn are represented in the professions more often than last born. And I could tell you a lot about that, but the point is that people read that and say, well, I'm firstborn, so I should be in the professions. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what it's about. What it's about is the way you are treated in the family, because of some families, like uh, most firstborn are found in the professions, most lastborn are found in uh, sports and sales and social, where social uh, contact is, is more common. But see, there, there are a lot of lastborn children are very shy and very wrong, right? You probably know something. It's not the birth order that causes this behavior. It's how the person is treated how they learn to interact with the family and that kind of thing is what causes these differences that we see. But the probability is, if you're firstborn, that any, do we have any lastborn children? Any of you who are lastborn? Have you ever seen a baby book? Have you? The middle ones are just lost. I mean, forget that. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're in trouble. You see, you, you know, you see, it's, it's the baby book, the baby book for the first one is about this thick, and if you have one for the last, last one, it's about this thick. And I remember my wife made it, I have two daughters, and my wife uh, made a mistake one time of talking about uh, Joanna, who's a, who's a baby, like, uh, she's a 50 year old baby, but. Uh, <laughs> Oh well, you were, you were, you, but you were second born. It's like we didn't do that for you. But it's like in the baby book, the first born. It's like the first word you said, it, they got in there when you, the day when you saw what you said, and when you smiled at your dad, and you know all these sorts of things, right? And so you got to understand if you understand reinforcement that they get reinforced a lot of things that the later ones don't. And most of the time, it's accomplishment, right? Some kind of first step, yeah, first word, first smile, all that. Because it's new, it's novel to the parent, so it's reinforceable. And so when I would come home, my wife would say, you know what Laura Lee did? <laughs> you know? well, we never heard that about Joel, I mean, because we've heard that already. You know, it was, it was old news. <laughs> it's not new news, even though it's a different, different person. And so it forms our personality, what we call our personality, in large part, but it goes unnoticed because it's just, we're just living. We're not, we're not doing an experiment with our children. <coughs> we're just living. But the point is, we all change every day. Nobody stays the same unless they're what? Dead. You're dead, you don't change. But otherwise, you're changing. Now you see, in a company, we change behavior every day. We don't know it, but we do. Every interaction changes people. Now the point is that it takes more than one reinforcer to, change, to develop a habit. So because you have an interaction with somebody, it changes both of you, your behaviors. But then you'll have another one with another person who actually reinforces the opposite. So the net result at the end of the day is you change, but it's not a noticeable kind of thing. My wife often says that I'm stubborn. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there's probably some evidence for that. But the point is that she thinks I'm getting more and more stubborn as I get older. Now, I don't know whether she's doing this to me or not, deliberately. Now, is she trying to make me more stubborn? I don't know, because she's not systematically 
uh, inadvertently reinforcing stubborn behavior. And so that's why, you know, it appears that you're pretty much the same day to day, even though I'm saying you're changing every day. Some things you, you do more often, you like more often, some things you don't. See, it's like as you get older, some things, because you're uh, being physically uh, challenged, as they would say, uh, you, you, used to, you used to enjoy something, now you don't enjoy it as much. And so you develop other likes, other things that you like more. Not that you don't like that, but it's just that it provides you with more reinforcement than the other thing. Now, most people, I would, I would suggest that it's not uh, particularly effective or, or uh, pleasurable to try to analyze every, everything. But some people think, when, when they find out what I do, it's like all of a sudden they get scared, like, like you, 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 you're watching me, you're, you're doing stuff to me. Well, I'm not, you know, I, 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 because I, I talk about people, you know, about uh, when people start talking about behavior and they know what I do, they kind of get, so well, now I, I don't study this. I'm not looking at you. I'm not, you're not a, you're not a, a, a subject or an experiment for me. You're just another person. So I, I act as just like being full of the foreign language. You know, you don't have to think, if you're speaking in English and that's not your native language, you don't have to think about, if you're fluent, you don't think about, oh, I need to speak English. You just do it, right? And sort of the same way with behavior. You just, you know, you just behave in a natural way, even though you understand that if I'm having a, a, an interaction with somebody, I, you know, behavior's changing. Well, I'm not thinking, what, what, what is, what's changing by my behavior? You just do it. Now, my point with this is, and it's probably a long way to say it, is that most of the time we don't understand how we are shaping better. Everybody, I think, here would agree that we learn from our environment. But would everybody okay doing like this? I'm not going to shape you into responding. But if you, you think that's true, you need to do this. In other words, if you look at a, a, a young a child, a baby, they're about, they're doing everything. They're pulling stuff off and but they're learning, right? They're learning, do that more or don't do that. And so they touch something that's hot. How many times do they have to do that before they learn not to do that? Just one time, right? And they hot, hot. And so something that's fuzzy and pleasurable, they want to play with it a lot. Something that's cold and hard, they don't want to fool. So we learn from our environment. Now think about this for a minute in terms of your workplace. You see, we, we, we take people and, and we have a, a charity that we started last year and we, our initial foray is in education. And it drives me crazy because the uh, educational system in the United States is terrible. Just terrible. And it's amazing people learn anything, you know, to be honest with you. Because if you think about a child who is five years old, it's hard to keep them down, right? I mean, they're into everything. And the, the most common thing they hear from their parents is stop that, get away from that, leave that alone. I'm kind of telling you, you know, that kind of, the kind of verbiage that we use, right? Because they have this conflict for an environment. Then they go to school. We say, all right, sit in that desk in rows Keep your hands and feet to yourself. If you have a question, raise your hand. What in the world happened? You know, all of a sudden I was having fun, and now all they're doing is telling me, be still, stop that, listen to me. I don't like this. They might like the idea, you know, like the first couple of weeks, they love it, and then after a while, you know, I have to go. Yes, you have to. Now, what I want you to understand as I go through some of this quickly is that if you believe that the environment changes behavior, which it does, in other words, it provides reinforces, punishes, and the like, naturally, then if people don't behave right at work, whose problem is it? 
You, you design the environment, right? So if you design the environment by the policies and rules and all this sort of stuff, the physical location and all that, if you design that and people don't act right in it, well, they'll tell you, where's the ball? It's in the environment. I was telling the group yesterday, I mean, blame is not a concept we use very often in this behavior change business. We don't blame the person for acting naturally in the environment we create. You see, if, if, you, if you've locked a person in this room, the natural behavior would be to try to get out, right? So if we see people breaking a window, you know, it's a natural thing that we expect. Because I tried the doors and the doors won't open and, you know, I, I don't know any other way to do that, so I break the window. I mean, that's a natural thing to do. It's not unusual to you, even in the hall, and I think you'll find this, this situation that, that people, at first, they decide about a new job. They get a new job, and how long are they excited? Short time, right? But what happens is that their expectation in terms of what they thought would happen to them having this job, what they were able to do, they were going to have, I'll have more responsibility, I'll be able to make more things happen, you know, in that job that I do now. And all of a sudden they realize they can't. So they're going to find reinforcement. That's our nature. So if we can't find it in the job, where do we find it? Well, if you have a cell phone, that's one way, right? Or if you can go on the internet, uh, this kind of thing. You know. Well, so what a lot, of, a lot of businesses try to do is they find people on the internet all the time, so what do they do? You know, it's interesting, in the United States, the most, most uh, searched topic during work hours is sex. During work hours. The people are uh, searching for sex uh, sites, you know, and that sort of thing. Because there's no reinforcement in their work. And then, well, how can we compete with that? Well, it's hard. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, if that's the only way you can get reinforcement, that's the way you get it. See, if I'm not getting reinforcement in my work, then I've turned first to my coworkers, right? And we'll talk about a movie we saw last night or television, something on television or, or that kind of thing. But we're going to get it. So the point is, you need to design the environment in a way that's favorable to the work you want. And to blame people gets you nowhere. And I find this all the time, I say, when I go, I say, well, how, people tell me, well, we got a problem. Well, how long have you had that problem? Ever since I've been here. Well, how long have you been here? 26 years. 26 years you've had the same problem? Well, you see, the reason they have the same problem is they blame the person. What's wrong with you? As much as I, I like to do that too, it's not helpful. Because I want to change, I want to change him, not the environment. <coughs> Now you see, if you think about rules, if you have a rule, by the way, if you have a rule, somebody is going to be upset. I can predict that. Either the person that made the rule is going to be upset if people don't follow it, and the people who follow the rule don't like it because they have to follow the rule. But the way we try to manage behavior at work is to make rules. I was uh, boarding a plane a while back in Atlanta, and it had just rained. And it was at a gate that's where you had to walk on the tarmac to get to the plane. And they had two lines, two yellow lines drawn, about three feet apart, going to the ramp, to the plane. Straight. This gate agent had a fit because people were walking outside the line to avoid the puddle in the road. You know, right? She was having a fit. Now she was following the rule. I mean, it was the rule 
But you keep people in the guidelines because of safety issues, you don't might run into a propeller or something, so you do that. And so I was one of you once you young guy because I didn't want to get my shoes wet. And I stepped out maybe a foot outside the line and she had a fit. Well, there's some organizations where safety people would say, boy, she's right. I'm glad you told me about that because she is right. Who, who, who is she? <laughs> But she followed the rule. But we don't understand. We made the rule to change behavior. We expect you to dress a certain way. We expect you to act a certain way when you come. We expect that. But we have designed the environment to produce that kind of behavior. And so the way we look at that is say, okay, is there a way we can design it so that it will work, so that they're happy about it, we're happy too. And what we try to do, lots of places, is to eliminate the rules. Or let the employees figure out the rules. We're in the 3M plant over in uh, Decatur, Alabama. And uh, they were going from two shifts to three shifts. They're going to work 24 hours a day. And so they designed a shift arrangement where you work uh, Three ten hour days and I don't know what they all. Some have worked four hour days, and people got real upset about that. And uh, so they were making all excuse me, all kind of noises about it. And uh, the manager who we've done some work with says, "Okay, well, excuse me, this is this is what we thought. Why don't y'all decide? You know, this is the old way." This is a new way. Y'all figure it out. So they got a committee together. They worked on it for about a month. And they came back in forward to the manager and they said, well, we've looked at everything, all the configurations, and we think the one you come up with is the best. There's no, no grousing there. Everybody, I mean, look, we decided that this is the best way to do it, so why don't we do it this way? I'm not following my script, but if you're reinforcing the wrong stuff, I don't know how this is happening, but, but it's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> but the, what, what's happening in the world today, and I, I don't have time to tell you all, and I don't know all, but I, I can tell you what is happening is that we're moving toward, and, and Morris tells me this is more of the Dutch way, a collaborative event. Collaborative. That we are, there's not a CEO in America who's not stood up for employees or communicated with employees in some way that blank is our most important asset. What is in the blank? Blank is our most important asset. People. And then as soon as they get in trouble, what do they do? They find the most important asset. You're in trouble, you find the most important. I mean, how does that make sense? Well, it doesn't make sense. They almost never go to people and say, we're having a problem. Help me. Figure this out. How can we do it? Here's what we need to do. Here's where we are. How do we get from here to there? Some of you may have heard of Lincoln Electric. Uh, Lenick Ark Welders. And uh, the, the owner, uh, I think it was the son of the owner actually, decided on a, uh, a performance pay system where um, you, you didn't have a salary, you were paid on the basis of your, your, work, your work, what you did. And uh, they gave a bonus at the end of the year that oftentimes was equal to the salary. You know, to what they've made. I mean, it was well known if you go to the web and, and uh, search on Lincoln Electric, you will you'll see this. So, and uh, they had done really well for many, many years. They're, they're over 100 years old now. And uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I'm, I'm at the age where I can't, you know, time flies, so I don't make dates too well. 
But it was a while ago, 10, 15 years ago. We had a recession. And of course, there were fewer demands for arc welders. So what did they do? They went to the people and said, hey, we're not selling enough to support what we're doing, so what do we do? And so they came with the idea that, that, that well, in a lot of places we never we never get to call on because they're not big enough and we don't have a sales force and call on everybody that uses our road. So so why don't we send all of our technical people out to the field, you know, to find uh, little shops and so on that we might sell to? And they avoided the recession. They had no layoff because the sales actually maintained during that year. But when you talk about it, it's a resource, it is a resource. And we, we know that when we help, when we ask, when we ask a lot of people to help us, that usually somebody's going to help you, right? I was telling a group yesterday also about um, there's something, some of you people in medicine, med the medical field, healthcare, um, there's something about uh, medical, uh, medical uh, uh, science. It's called folding proteins. I don't know exactly what it is, but I've heard about it a lot. It's talking about being able to fold proteins. Now, you know, we're talking about microscopic, microscopic stuff. And, and they couldn't figure out how to do this with a problem. So what they did on the web, they said, hey, we're having, we're having trouble figuring out how to do this. And anybody that has an idea, let us know. Well, a woman in England solved the problem. Guess where the job was? She's a secretary. I mean, she advanced medical science dramatically. Well, how did she do that? Well, she loved working puzzles. You know, she did it in a fair time. So over the weekend, she took this problem and, and she solved it. Now, you see, it really is a resource that is, is not used very much. I was, uh, we did a lot of work with Kodak, and that demise was not our fault, you know. <laughs> but but uh, uh, they were a good client early on, and uh, uh, there's a guy there who was, he was an Englishman actually, and, uh, because I loved his accent, and uh, he had, he was a, uh, a line employee, he was an hourly employee, but he was uh, a step above the front line because he would step in for the supervisor sometime when the supervisor wasn't there. And uh, he, when we uh, started working with him, his manager told me, he said, I gave him your book. Now, it's, 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 we call it the R plus book, but it's a, it's, a, it's a long book. You know, it's, it's used by universities more uh, now than any other businesses. And so it's like 300 pages. And uh, he read the book. He says he carries that book around like the Bible. You know, he's walking around and somebody asks him a question. He said, well, it's right here. And he, he would show up. And he had used this with his team until the point that the team performed in ways that caught attention to other places. And other people at his same level started asking him if they, he would come and help their team. Now, this was in no way what he was paid to do. Well, it, it, it spread so much that they heard about it at the level of the president. Now, Kodak Park at that time had 22,000 employees. And John was asked to have dinner at lunch in the, with the president and his staff. <coughs> to tell about how he had done this. And so, I uh, spoke to him afterwards and I said, John, how was it? He said, they eat good. Well, I'm sure they do, but I mean, what did what they, what they ask you? He said, well, the president asked me, he said, well, John, what do you have to tell us? He said, you shouldn't ask me that. I said, well, I said, well, what I told him was about my first day at Kodak. He said, you know, nobody no young person ever rides by this plant and says, someday I want to be an operator at Kodak. 
says, no young person has that ambition. He said, do you know why? He said, why, John? He said, well, first day I came to Kodak Park, he said, I want the job about an hour. I had an idea. I called my supervisor over and said, hey, have y'all ever thought, he said, before I finish my sentence, he said, John, how did you get to work today? He said, what do you mean? He said, how did you get to Kodak Park? He said, in my car. He said, well, how about tomorrow? Leave your brain in your car. He said, I can't. He said, why not? He said, I drive a compact. <laughs> Now, I told that story to another one of our customers. Can you tell us also about the science a little bit more? How you do, how you create these great results? Are you a troublemaker? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I told a story to uh, another one of our customers, and a uh, guy came to me after and he said, he said, that exact thing happened to me. He said, I was working for the telephone company. He said, on my first day, we were just, we, I was out installing the telephone pole. He said, and I had an idea. And he said, when I saw the supervisor come up, he wasn't with him, you know, he came up to the job site. And he, he said, I went out to meet him that's his first day. He said, hey, I thought about, and he stopped me. He said, you're not paid to think. Get the damn pole in the ground. But here's the thing, he said, I never did it again. He said, I realized at that moment, you ain't gonna like this. I went back to school. And you see the, 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 about the science. There's a thing in science that if innovation, new ideas, have a short history of reinforcement. And they're, they're extinguished very quickly. So if somebody has an idea and it's punished, guess what? They may have another idea, but you'll never know about it, right? Because they'll go home in their garage or in their basement or with their friend, they're going to work on it. So I think there's something here. Now, if you look at uh, this, let me just uh, make one other point about the science. There are a lot of people who write books, and I'm one of them, so I, I can't be too critical of that, except that uh, many people write books on their personal experience. And Benjamin Franklin said it well. He said, experience of dear teacher, but fools will learn no other. Experience of dear school, and fools will learn no other. You know, you can have good, good and bad experiences, and we all you know, have some of both. But the fact of the matter is that when we talk about the science, we're talking about something that has not two or three studies. And we're talking earlier today about the idea that replication of studies is not, universities don't do this very often. No, because they want you to do something new and novel, and they want you to do something somebody else has already done, right? And so we accept bad data. We accept bad results. And we want to say, well, so-and-so found and I read a study just recently about medical, medical uh, results, medical studies. There's something like 35% of them cannot be replicated. And that should ex that to concern you if you have a health problem, go to the hospital. If somebody has done something to uh, create fraudulent data, because we can't repeat that. Now what I've got up here is you know, when you ask about reinforcement, what's the research, I can point you to 50,000 studies. Not actually myself, but I mean, I could, we could find, somebody could find 50,000 studies. I mean, I belong to an association that every year they do about 2,000 2, studies at this conference. And guess what they're all on? Well, they're all on this. And Behavior is the centerpiece, and A stands for antecedents, and C stands for consequence. And this is this year will be the 41st year we've been doing this. And every year we've had between one and 2,000 studies. So, 
And they're all about the same kind of thing. It's about, we, we, we know that reinforcement works. We know the consequences work. And so it's some change about, can we make it more efficient, more effective, and so on. This, this is, to behavior analysis, what this is to physics. You see, a lot of people say, well, that's, you mean you can explain all behavior with A, B, and C? Absolutely. All behavior. Routine behavior, creative behavior, innovative behavior, funny behavior, uh, you know, whatever it is we want, is A, B, or C. Now, we don't know everything there is to know, because we, this year we're going to have a conference, I forget where it is, but there will be 2,000 more studies, at least. But we're learning more and more about it. In other words, we know a lot more about the effect of reinforcement today than we did you know, 40 years ago. But each study fills out the picture a little more, as you would in chemistry or physics. Right? Now, if you understand that antecedents or anything that comes before it tells you what to do, right? as a stop sign will tell you, in uh, Amsterdam, I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> a red light, what does a red, red light mean? Hurry? Uh, but a stop sign is an antecedent for either the hitting the accelerator or the brake to stop. Now many people don't stop because the consequences they've experienced don't match the behavior of society. Right? So there, there's, a, there's a, a, a consequence that's assumed that if you don't stop, something bad will happen to you. But guess what? Most of the time, it doesn't. You just get where you're going faster than if you'd stop for the life. So people don't stop. Now you might say, well, you do. I do. Why doesn't everybody else stop? Well, everybody, remember, everybody's different from you. They've had different experiences with something as simple as stopping for a stop sign. See, you may have lived, you may have grown up in the country where uh, you can see all directions and there's no traffic and there's a stop sign there, but what do you do? You ignore it because you can see, I can see there's not, nobody coming. So there's nothing going to happen to me. And so you come to the city and guess what? Even though you see things, you, you ignore that part of the environment and you go off. Now, so the closest thing we have, however, in other words, antecedents are variable in terms of producing behavior. Right. So sometimes we obey them, sometimes we don't. But it's always in terms of favor you. Because you always have, like, you have an excuse for why I didn't stop, right? Well, I was in a hurry. That's like the guy that would have stopped. Uh, this is a quote from somebody, a patrolman stopped, says, why are you going so fast? He said, well, I was afraid I'm going to run out of gas. <laughs> so I had to, you know, really go fast to get to the gas station. Well, we can always justify our behavior, but the fact of the matter is that we always fall into consequences in a way that's unique to us, that matches, matches our history, our experience uh, in the world. Uh, so here are some things uh, in summary fashion very quickly. That there are basically four behavioral consequences. Now, we didn't invent these. These have been discovered, you know, in science. And people say, well, it, will, will it work in Holland? Well, or do we have people in Holland? I think it will work in Holland. Yes, I do. Wait, do you have, is your heart on the left or right side? Because you, you, you're duck, Dutch Landers, or whatever you call yourself. No, you're not going to call yourself Dutch Dutch Landers. That's true, isn't it? Anyway, you know, you don't have your heart on the opposite side that I do. You know, I'd, be, I'd be afraid to go to the doctor here because he might not know where my heart is. Because I'm an American. <laughs> I'm a person first, right? So, you know, I go to the doctor here as comfortably as I would in the United States because I know you're going to find my organs in the same place. 
And the same thing with behavior. You respond to gravity, you respond to reinforcement, you respond to the effects of your environment. Just like we do everywhere else. So if we look at it, there are two ways. Here's, here's a summary of some things that are important. There are two ways that we get people to do something more often. One's with positive reinforcement. The other's with negative reinforcement. Now the difference between the two is that positive reinforcement is the only consequence that maximizes performance. Now, the problem you see in organizations is that when you're in trouble, you get more negative. Have you ever noticed that? If we don't improve, if we don't improve productivity, somebody's going to lose their job. You know. And, and but but it should be a time to see if you understand reinforcement that positive reinforcement accelerates the rate of response. It accelerates the rate of response. So what it does, if we're in trouble, what do we do? We need to be using positive reinforcement more frequently to cause that uptick in behavior. But we typically do things that cause behavior to go down from the time we need the most. I mean, that's how uh, rational we are, or irrational. We want to stop behavior, then we have punishment and penalty. And punishment is where you get something you don't want. Uh, penalty is where you lose something you have. As a fine, you know, you, you, you speed and occasionally somebody is caught and they have to pay a fine. You know, you've got money that they take from you because you did something you weren't supposed to do. And those two things stop behavior. So if you think about applying this in the workplace, if you want people to do something more often, then what we got to do is to find a way that they experience, that they experience positive consequences for what they do. Now, I don't have it up here, but ignoring behavior would cause what, do you think? Would it cause people to do something more often or less often? It's called extinction. And so if, if you've reinforced the behavior to get it up and you stop, eventually the behavior will go down. It undergoes, the technical term will be, it undergoes extinction. Huh? Yeah, yeah, well, when you, you, you just, the behavior that was reinforced does not, no longer produces reinforcement, so you, you just quit at the time. I mean, it's like you, you try a vending machine or something, and you put your money in, and it falls back out. You put it in, and it falls back out, and after a while, you say, ah, oh, it's going to work. We do this kind of thing at work all the time. If, if I'm doing something at work, and it doesn't produce any change in the environment, Eventually, I stop. Now, the good news you see from management is that this is all rational. And so much of what is written in the literature is very hard to implement. Say, so, well, you need to be more humble and tell a leader. You, you, humility is something you need to develop. Well, the question you should have is, what behavior are you talking about? What am I supposed to do? I learned lots of lessons early on uh, because I didn't have business training and that was probably, might have been a plus, I don't know. But I was in a, a textile mill and they were having real turnover problems. That they couldn't keep people on the job because they were paying <coughs> bad wages, the environment was noisy and you know, you know, a lot of negatives. And uh, so I'm talking to Howard, the plant manager. And he's telling me all these problems, you know, these, huh? and I said, uh, doing my psychology self, you know, I said, uh, well, Howard, uh, what do you think you ought to do? He looked at me and he said, hell, if I knew what to do, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> I learned, you know, I got to be able to tell him, look, Howard, do this more often. Don't do that. Do this. And we're going to track that and we're going to see, is that more or less often, so we'll know that do this more or do this less. I thought it's doing it. Now, uh, I could talk to you a long time about this, but the thing about it is, if you think about the first diagnostic is, do I want more or less or less of it? 
If I want more of it, then I only got two choices. I'd be positive and negative reinforcement. The less of it, I'd be positive and negative. Now the question for you, of course, is well, which one should I do? Well, here's the deal, and this is something a lot of people don't understand or believe. And that is that positive reinforcement gets more behavior than negative, even though negative reinforcement increases behavior, positive reinforcement is going to get more. I'm going to call out a want to curve. But I do this because I want to, not because I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't. No, negative reinforcement is where you, you increase your behavior, you increase effort in order to escape or avoid some negative consequence. It might not surprise you, or maybe it does. Goal setting is typically a negative reinforcement procedure. Most people get get to go. The consequence of getting to go is you avoid the displays of the band. So they think we've got something that our problem is goal setting. No, it's not goal setting. It's about the way you treat people. Now, in case my time runs out, which it probably is, let me just say, make sure you understand this. The worst advice you could ever give or get is always be positive. Positive reinforcement increases the behavior that precedes it. So if somebody done something wrong, that's not the time to positive reinforce them. Now, my friends, my golfing buddies particularly, when we go on a trip, you know, we're eating at a restaurant, and they'll see a child misbehaving at a nearby table, and it's like all heads turn to me. <laughs> and the question they have is, well, how are you going to, how are you going to positive reinforce that? <laughs> because they, they think I'm like I'm a positive, I spend positive stuff, you know, that, that I think all problems can be solved with positive crime. No, no, it can't. There's a time to be negative, a time to be positive, but it's important to know the difference, right? Now, as a parent, you know, I have two girls, and, and <coughs> I guess people who know me know that they're aware, right? They've got me wrapped right around the finger. They can get anything they want from me. And I can remember as a child, uh, I can remember them as a child, when they would do something wrong, I mean, I wanted their attention. I wanted, I wanted them to know that I loved them and so on. And so I would find myself telling them, while they're crying, that I love them. Because I would I'd punish them in some way, you know, I was deprived of something or whatever. And I wanted to know this was not the end of the world and that daddy still loves you. And well, I learned later, like people say to me, I wish I'd known this 20 years ago. I, I've said the same thing. That is not the time to have that conversation. They've done something to displease me, so go cry, get it over with. But when you come out and change the way you behave toward your sister, then we're going to talk about how daddy loves you, right? Because you see, when they're upset and I tell them daddy loves you, you know what, what they think? You don't. You don't care a thing about me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you run across these sorts of things, right? So what happens is that reinforcement is most effective that is immediate. All consequences are most effective when they're immediate. And this is why, you know, you've heard catch, uh, phrases like catch somebody doing something, doing something right and so on. And it's true. You know, the best time to use consequences of any kind, positive or negative, is when the behavior, people are engaged in the behavior. Any time later, you see, what can happen is if somebody does something at point A and you recognize it for, at point B as the time gap, other behaviors can come into play, right? But we don't stop behaving during the interval. We do things, and it could be, it could be, many times it happens, that the behavior that intervenes is bad. And by the time we get around recognizing it, you know, it's the wrong behavior. Now this is why it's important, you see, for supervisors, and 
And in some organizations are training peers, we train everybody in the company sometimes, that they're in a, the employees are in the best position to catch other people doing the job training. So when they see somebody doing something that's helpful, particularly when the person has been helpful before, it's important that behavior becomes recognized. Because that's the novel behavior of that person, and it has a short uh, life if it's not supported in some way by consequence. So peers are a good source of uh, effect, efficient reinforcement. Now, if, if you understand, you read terms like operant conditioning, uh, respondent conditioning, these sorts of terms, and they confuse people, but let me just make it easy to understand. Operant conditioning, Jeff's going to use that, and, and basically what he meant was that any behavior that operates on your environment, in other words, by operating, it changes the environment in a way that's favorable to use the people. And one thing I used to do in the classes I would do, I'd say, I want you to write down the number of positive reinforcement. This is like first thing, 8 o'clock in the morning. I want you to write down a list of all the positive reinforcements you've got since you got up. I'm like, what? I haven't, I haven't been around anybody. Well, you didn't turn the water on? You see, the behavior of turning the faucet operates on the environment to produce something that's valuable to me in the moment, right? So what is the what is the reinforcer in this case? The water comes out. I turn the handle on the door and push, and what do I get? I get positive reinforcement. I get a mean a positive mean certain consequence. And so the next time I want to go out the door, I know exactly what to do. And so our environment is filled with consequences that change our behavior day to day. And the more you know about those, what they are and what people experience, then the more position you're in to cause people to do the kinds of things that the organization values. Um, see, uh, let me just go to this quickly. Here's something that um, uh, becomes important. Because people want, it's easy to tell people what to do, right? We get everybody together and huddle and say, okay, here's what we're going to do today. Any question? Okay, go do it. Well, sometimes they will do it. And many times they will do it because, in fact, they know that it's valued by the supervisor and the supervisor lets them know. Another time, you know, I was in a plant years ago and, uh, I was visiting the supervisor, this is when I was doing more on the ground work. I was visiting the supervisor, talked to him about some quality problem or what. And as I was talking to him, uh, this employee came out, uh, his, his, his boss. And even though I was there, even though I was there, he starts shooting them out. I mean, he was, his language was vulgar, his voice was loud, his behavior was offensive, you know, really. And it was embarrassing to me, and, and you know, you kind of stand and look down at your shoes, you know, while you hear this. And I mean, I, I mean, it was, it was, I had not been working in the plants very long, and, you know, I didn't quite know what to say. And so when he walked away, I said, man, I said, he got off to a bad start today, didn't he? You know what he said to me? Don't pay him no mind. That's the way he is. Because what he told him was, he said, if this happens again, I'm going to fire you. He said, he says it all the time. He said, if I've been fired every time he told me I've been fired, I wouldn't work here a week. So he's going to fire me every week. Well, nobody paid any attention. And this is why we ignore a lot of our environment because it doesn't produce any consequences for us at the minimum. And so we have all these rules, you know, about what people are supposed to do, but if there's never any consequences, you know, we ignore it. Well, it doesn't mean anything. You see, it's like, uh, my wife didn't like me to tell you this, but, but she's, she's complaining to me, well, you never listen to me. 
And she's right. She talks all the time. <laughs> I was her. I mean, after a while, you know, what'd you say? <laughs> I mean, that if we have rules and we don't follow them, then we forget the rule. I work with the nuclear power industry a lot in the United States. And they never saw a process that they didn't like. And they keep adding processes, they never eliminate one. There's not one that replaces another, it's always that. And they got, they got a stack of processes, I'm not exaggerating when I say from the floor here. Nobody can know them all. You can't know them all. And so they, they tend to ignore them. And they have accidents and so on, you know, because people don't pay any attention to them. Now you see, it's, it, we want to blame them say, well, they're not motivated. They don't care. Well, that's wrong. It doesn't solve the problem. You say that. See, what I want you to begin to think is, how, how are we operating? What kind of environment we create to cause people to think we don't care? Or to think it's okay to do sloppy work? Or it's okay to leave something half done when you go home and the attendance lady could have fixed it. And we could have made a customer happy. So we delivered it ahead of time. I mean, all of those kinds of things occur are occurring naturally. So the best way to respond to that is to turn inward and say, okay, what, what have we created here that causes people to think that's okay? How have we designed the environment? We've got these rules, we come with a rule, and we don't follow it. And so we say, anybody that we catch doing this is going to be fired. And it turns out that the best performer you've got does it. Right? And then what you say is, I'm telling you, next time, you're going to be fired. The U.S. government is crazy about that. The government is crazy about this. They say stuff that they never do. And then they wonder why people don't follow the law. Because the environment tells them it's okay. Now, they would, they would not want to characterize it that way. I don't say it's okay. We never say it's okay. But if you look at the consequences, and we have a tool, if you, if you learn more about this, it's called a picnic analysis, where we can figure out why do, people, why do people, whenever somebody says, why do you do that? Then we take them through a picnic analysis and say, look, let's see if we can't look at the consequences they experience in our environment and see why they would do that. And most often when they do that, it's like this. Oh, gee, now see. That our environment really is, is designed to produce that kind of behavior. Now, we wouldn't think of it that way. But I want you to begin to think that way. There was a manager we had for a company uh, in, in uh, America called uh, Dollar General. And Dollar General started as a cooperative from farmers put it together to buy by volume so they could have cheaper uh, fertilizer and stuff. And it's been very successful now. I think about, about 1,800 children. But we worked in the distribution centers. And, uh, the manager in Zane, Ohio, was one of the best managers I've worked with. Because they had seven dollar an hour employees. They basically seven dollars an hour. They uh, had routine work because it was the distribution center they had uh, all these uh, conveyor belts that had packages on and so on. And uh, they were pulling stuff and putting them on the, the conveyor belt and loading it on a truck and doing thousands of these a day. Thousand of them a day. And in order to get a job at uh, Zane, Ohio, you had to know somebody. In other words, a friend, they got most of their employees from friends recommending them to come. And one of the reasons for that was that, that the, the plant managed, whenever they would lose somebody, either they quit to get another job or they fired them, which was rare, he'd get his team together. And he'd ask the question, how did we fail that person? Now, the first line of questioning was, 
about us. How did we do this? Did we hire the right person? Did, did we follow our hiring procedures? When, we, when, they, when they came to work, you know, how did we deal with them and train them? Did we put them on the line before they really showed us that they could do the job? Did, uh, uh, when they worked, when they noticed we had a problem with performance on the line, how do we respond to that? And of course, most of the time they found the problem was ours, not theirs. And so they created an environment where people wanted to be. And see, that's where we have positive, positive reinforcement, is people want to be here. We don't have to make them come. We don't have to think about how we can penalize them if they don't, or how we can make them perform to some standard or what. They do that because they want to, because we design an environment to produce positive consequences when they do. Now, you see, most people think about positive consequences as something you put in your pocket. We call it tangible reinforcement. You know, and most people think about money and this kind of thing. Don't think that way. The most frequent consequences are not anything that you could put in your mouth or, or your pocketbook. The most effective consequences are interpersonal. And it may be, it may be a smile. I like to smile, by the way. It may be a smile, it could be a thumbs up, it could be, you know, a lot of things. It costs you nothing. You know, it's like, I, I, I know things are changing and I'm old, you know, and I've been around a long time. But I've known supervisors who would, by self-admission, tell me I never, I have never, ever told somebody I appreciate the job. They've been there for 20 years. They've never told anybody they do a good job. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm give you a sexy statement, then I'm going to stop in four minutes. Can I have four minutes? You took up a lot of time, you know, talking talk about <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that women are naturally better at this than men. And that's not sex state of the sex, it's just a fact. And I think it's because women are trained, not for this end, but just the natural part of the way little girls are taught, they're taught to notice things that men don't notice. You know, I have, my wife has taught me over the years that, you know, I, I don't notice things. And I blame it on hunter gatherer or some kind of philosophy like that, you know, that I'm gonna go out and kill something and bring it into the family to eat for a month or what. And you take care of the thing at home, right? And you, you notice the fleas and you pick the fleas and indicate, you know, whatever they did. But they but women look at small things. And see the most effective way to change behavior, this concept right here, shaping behavior. Shaping is the positive reinforcement of successive approximations to the goal. And those of you who can see the smallest improvement and reinforce it will get the fastest change. I wrote a book called Oops, and the subtitle is 13 Main Practices to Waste Time and Money. And I went on to say, and what to do instead. And stretch goals is number two. It's not number two, but it just happens to be number two in the book. And I mean, the people that, in the new comparison just wanted to argue with me about that. I mean, I, and I knew they were, I knew they were fight. Because they just have this culture that you always set a stretch goal. Well, the data shows that stretch goals work less than 10% of the time. But somehow we have this belief that if we set a goal here, then we know that we know that or not set it where the max is. So we want to say, well, let's set a stretch goal and they set one up here. Well, it's like the goal is going to pull performance out of you. It's going to make you do something you wouldn't otherwise do if you were not there. Well, if that's the case, that's negative reinforcement. So what happens is the most effective way to set a goal is to set the smallest goal. 
Those of you who can see the smallest change and reinforce it will get the fastest approval. Because remember, positive reinforcement accelerates the rate of responding. So what that means is if you're in trouble, then you've got to figure out a way, how can we do this more often? How can we reinforce it more often? He said, well, can you do it too much? I said, you probably can, but don't worry about it. You're not even going to come close. You won't come close. I'm 80, and I, I play golf as often as I can, which is not much. And I can tell you that my, the fellows I've been playing with for many years now, never, ever fail to positively reinforce a good job. Sometimes they'll even reinforce a bad shot, but they're going to say something about it. You know, I got a friend who's big around and he is tall. His name is Gene. And Gene has what we call the ability to hit a double cheek. And I'm not talking about these cheeks. And so when he hits one, he hits it a long way. And we call it a double cheek. Boy, Gene, that was a double cheek. Now, it doesn't even have to be in the fairway for us to say something positive about it, right? Man, boy, that'd have been great to have been in the fairway. Yeah, I mean, it was way down there. <laughs> it's in the rough. And they'll say, boy, that was a good shot for my life. That was a tough life. You hit that really good. Now you take my friends and put them at the workplace. And it's like God struck them down. They cannot say anything positive what? Now I say, why is that? They say, well, I don't see anything. <laughs> you know? We work a lot, a lot of places where most of the supervisors are female, and I tell you, it, I mean, they're baking cakes, they're bringing stuff in, they're buying stuff, they're recognizing, you know, all kinds of behavior and so on, and men are just kind of standing there with their hands in the pocket. That's a fact. And I said, for the men, what I say is, you have to work hard at something that many women do not. Now, let me just say one final thing, because they, they're looking at me hard now. Let's see if we can change this behavior. <laughs> <laughs> that in the United States, I don't know whether it's a, a prevalent here or not, but in the United States, there is this um, child-rearing method now that parents have uh, come to that you all you ought to positively reinforce your child. What they mean is, you always say something positive. You never say anything negative. Did you, did you have American Idol over here when it was popular? Do you know the show where they had people perform? And they had this Englishman who was, uh, who started it, um, Simon Cowell. And he was tough on people. He was really tough on people. Simon Cowell. Yeah. He, he's a very rich man now, but and he made a lot of it on American Idol. But they would have these contestants, you know, they have a, oh, my daughter's an actress, and they call it a cattle call. So they said, oh, we want people, you know, who want to sing on this. And so everybody would come, right? And some people were awful. And Simon Cowell was the, probably the first person in their lives to tell them the truth. I remember one night he said to this young girl, he said, look, don't say anymore. He said, and what I mean, don't say anymore. Don't even say in the shower. <laughs> and the girl started crying. And she said, but people at church love my singing. <laughs> like, you know, people think, well, I'm supposed to say something positive. Her singing was awful and then, and they'd say, you know, oh yeah, I love your boy. She's awful, isn't she? But the point is, she heard, they love my singing. And why don't you like it? And so parent, young parents now are creating children that are going to have a, sh a sharp reality check when they get older, right? Everybody will like your mama. Everybody will love everything you do. Even in sports, you don't have a loser. 
right? Everybody wins. My, uh, we play uh, soccer. Okay. And my grandchildren. <laughs> all Don't worry, I have to change your name. This is it, this is it, this is it. This is the final one. But see, they, they respond to me very well. I can help us. My friend, uh, her grandson was playing soccer, and uh, they don't keep score. Because you keep score, I mean, somebody loses, right? And so she was late to practice to the game one day, and when her grandson saw her, he's playing on the field, and he came run over the sideline, said, Grandma, says, we lead in 72, we're not supposed to know it. <laughs> and we're like, I'm fully fooling here. Now, I'm going to stop because uh, maybe you'll have some questions, but, but I think the, the point I want to get across in the time that we've got, and I hope I've gotten some of it across, is that this is important, it's an important science to know. If we own general happiness and well-being, as well as what it can do for you, you know, the primary reason, I, what I've done, is help companies solve problems they've been struggling with for years. And many companies, like they, they, you know, like a fast food restaurant or something, they think that turnover is inevitable. That we, we're, we're employing high school students and they're going to go off and they're going to go away. And so we built into our uh, business model a figure to account for that. We're going to, we're going to have such a such turnover, so we, that's going to cost us so much, so we have to add that to the price to buy the service. It's not true. What that assumes is we're going to keep the same business model we got. We're going to treat people like, like uh, they don't want to be here, and they leave, naturally. And so we think, well, that's just the cost. That's just the way this business is. We've never found that. So, I believe, and I think we've got lots of data, we, we have a magazine we call Forbes Magazine, we, we quit, quit publishing several years ago, but we have, we come out today, we got uh, 80, 80 issues of case studies that people did, you know, applying to, to the widest range of business problems you can imagine. You want to be more innovative, it's about the way you treat people. And I don't mean, we want to treat people well, just because we want to treat people well. We want to treat people well in the context of doing what we do. But those people that help us the most are the ones we want to make the most of, right? And if you're not doing what we want to do, then we're going to figure out how to help you do that. So you can get, you want that kind of treatment, then here's the way you get it. But you're not going to get it the way you're performing. Does everybody understand that point? It's very important. And the way business operates today is that we want, we want to do things the easy way. What you think is the easy way, we're going to pay people the same, we're going to give people the same benefits and so on. Well, that's a very expensive way to run a business. Because it doesn't produce the kind of results out the end that you consider to be ready. I'm going to defy the laws of behavior now and stop. <laughs> give Obi a warm applause. Twenty more minutes. <laughs> I'm going to punish him. Oh, we thank you very much. Um, you gave us a lot of lessons. In this 40 years of scientific behavior analysis, and uh, Aubrey managed it to explain to us uh, that in one and a half hours. But there's much more to tell, us, much more to experience, and much more to explore. So if you'd like to uh, want to know more about this, um, I invite you to go uh, to the restaurant, to the, uh, to the bar, have a drink. Then we have a, a few books there. You can uh, look into the books. Um, and I suggest also that you are all uh, are around there so that you can ask, uh, or that you can, um, if you have some questions, then ask them and we can explain uh, those questions. And uh, for the last, we have, Small present, or we, uh, me business wants to give you a oh, present. Does. Oh, wow. A diamond ring, oh my god! Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you.
Dank u dat u bent. Dank u wel voor jullie aandacht. Uh, ademloos zit te luisteren, heb ik in ieder geval is mij in ieder geval opgevallen. Uh, we zullen ongetwijfeld nog heel veel vragen voor jullie leveren. Nogmaals, ga mee naar de park en uh, stel je vragen. En wij zijn er ook uh, aanwezig. Als je nu naar huis wil gaan, dat kan natuurlijk uiteraard ook. Als ze naar de park toe gaan, daar wordt in ieder geval een drankje jullie aangeboden. Neem je voor de volledigheid, neem je jas even mee die als je die in de garderobe hebt hangen. Want we komen hier verder uh, niet meer terug. Uh, dank je wel voor jullie aanwezigheid. Uh, wij zullen jullie voorgaan naar de, uh, naar de zaal toe, naar de naar het bar toe. En uh, hoop ik tot snel ziens. Ciao. Wolle Joost, ze zijn al weg. Ja, ja. ja. Neem ik wel mijn zoon, Joost.